as usual, announcements to start things off. Um, there's a homework that's available on Canvas. Um, it's been out there for almost 10 days now. It's due this Friday. Um, the good news is there's no programming. Uh, and it's only math. So maybe that's good news. I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, if people have told me that this homework can take time. So if you haven't started already, please do start. Um, it's one of those things where once you see the answer, it looks very easy. Um, and I think I see a couple of heads nodding. That means that uh, you've seen the answer. Um, the rest of you, please start soon. The other, you know, and if you need uh, uh, help or discussion, please come to office hours. Um, uh, if there are any quick questions, we can take them. Uh, we can kind of address them here. Yes. Well, the, I, I don't remember what is specifically 1.2, but I can answer that question more generally. Uh, the implication of this of understanding sample complexity is that it gives you a sense of whether the problem, uh, whether a certain problem is solvable using a certain uh, data set. So if you have a certain number of examples, can you be at least reasonably sure in understanding whether this um, this concept class uh, can do it justice? Th that's really what it is. And more than anything else, it's a um, it's the same kind of implication that you get with the big O notation. Uh, it, it's not about this particular data set that you have because we don't know uh, the true concept and such things. But just like the big O notation, where uh, in the limit, you understand whether this kind of a problem is uh, easy or not. Uh, and from a computational point of view, sample complexity tells you whether a certain class of problems is easy or not, provided you're using this set of functions. And does that help when you are looking for uh, finding the uh, algorithms that is sufficient for? Uh, well, not directly, it does not. Where it does help, and that's going to be one of the topics that, that will be the main topic of today, is it might help us with designing new kinds of learning algorithms or learning criteria, because you know from the sample complexity bounds that, uh, uh, or not the sample, generalization bounds really, that if you want to, if you want the generalization error to be low, you want something else that upper bounds it to be low. And that other thing is measurable and you can directly optimize for that. So it leads to that kind of, a, th th that style of thinking. I thought you were going one way, but I'm now not sure. What do you mean by determine the depth? In uh, are you are you asking an algorithmic question or are you asking a hyperparameter question? So algorithmically, you can do both. You can grow the full tree and then prove. Or you can just stop growing after a certain depth. So, both are possible. Uh, when 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 you say our desire, it's a little bit. The scene is too loud. When you say our desire, it's a little bit vague. But so I would re uh, re uh, cast that as based on say uh, cross validation. Or even after growing growing the tree, you can kind of prune and bring it down to a certain depth. How deep should you? How much should you prune? Once again, it's being cross validated. And both of these things are done in some. But there are there is one situation where the depth tends to be chosen up front, um, and that tends that that happens when you're uh, building an ensemble of trees. So, for example, uh, the, a, a very famous example of that is boosted decision trees or boosted decision stumps. A decision stump is nothing but a tree with one feature, just one node, and then the, uh, there's one feature that's tested, and then the output. When you build a boosted decision stump. You have committed to depth one trees because you know that you're not using the tree to really get a great classifier. You just need a big classifier because boosting is what's going to make it good. So in those kinds of situations, you pick the depth up front. Yes. Um, I have a question about 
uh, the structures. And then can we have a, a feature with itself as one of its nodes? In your homework or in general? Just in general. In general, you can, but there's no point to. Okay. There's, there's no reason to do that because if you think about it, you know, consider the following situation. Let's say we let use the feature X41. Mm -hmm. And I test for this, and let's say these are Boolean features. So this can be either a true or a false. And now, once again, let's say I check for X41. We know that X41 is true in this path. There's no reason to check for that. Yeah. So in practice, there's no reason for it. So is that structurally different than a step one tree? Structurally, this is different. Okay. Uh, when I say structurally, I mean, what data structure are you storing in your memory? Okay. Um, clearly, structurally, this is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But functionally, no. Right? I mean, because there's no reason for doing this. So in the homework, do we need to account for these, or do we just ignore these? Um, there's an instruction there, which I, I, I don't remember exactly which way I fell on that. So if there is an instruction, follow that. If not, explain what you're doing. What I, I, I believe that in the home, you're asking about the thing where you're counting trees, right? Yeah. Yeah. So honestly, for that thing, all I need is the oh. answer to be right in the big O notation. Okay. So a lot of these things, it turns out, are not going to matter. So they give the answer in the big uh, as a in, in big O. That's all. That's really all that matters. There's a question on Zoom about the last question. If C assigns B when it's correct, does it complement assign minus B when it holds? I don't understand the question. Um, Oh, this is for the depth, the decision list, I'm assuming. Yeah, so uh, the complement of a tree will basically assign the inverse label for any example. Whenever, uh, if one tree assigns, uh, or uh, this is a decision list. If one decision list assigns true for an example, the complement will assign false for that. So it's literally negating that thing. Uh, in the VC dimension question one, there are no unfilled dots for the negative class. Is this deliberate? Um, are there only positive points in that question? Okay. I, I have to actually see that question to answer this. Maybe I can take that uh, uh, after the class. Um, a few other announcements. Uh, this, uh, th this is more just uh, uh, very uh, logistical. Tomorrow's office hours will be moved to Friday. Uh, it will still be on Zoom, but it will be on Friday um, because UN has some constraint Wednesday morning. Um, and the other thing is just a reminder uh, of things coming your way. Um, Project Milestone 2 uh, will be due on April 4th. It's basically the same as Milestone 1, but just two more submissions. Uh, Milestone 1 had one submission and a small report. Milestone 2 says make two more submissions and a small report. And... Uh, Milestone three is really the final report will involve three more submissions. Uh, it's mostly to make sure that uh, you're not stuck with a whole bunch of work at the end of the semester so that uh, things kind of move fast, move, you know. I have, there, there's a reason why I have these milestones. Uh, there's an, uh, in an earlier version of the class, I did not have these milestones. And I found that most students did the project on the last day when it's due. And they are like, I need to run six things and I need to submit six things on campus. Um, and I don't have, I can't do it because I have a final exam and another final exam and a project to both write. This is mostly to make sure that uh, you don't get into that situation. There are two more uh, 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 submissions that need to be up uploaded to Kaggle by the fourth. Um, your uh, the other sort of logistical things uh, after this Friday, there will be homework five. Homework five will be entirely on Canvas. It will look a little bit like homework three, but. Uh, uh, but it won't be like homework three. It will be entirely on Canvas. Uh, it will involve Adaboost and a little bit of other stuff. And uh, homework six, just so that you have time for planning, homework six will have uh, have you in, it, it, it in, in some sense the inverse of homework four. It is almost entirely experiment with just a little bit of kit. Uh, you'll be writing code to implement support vector machines and logistic regression. Um, and the reason I'm kind of sharing this with you is because uh, 
that can help you making plans going ahead for your project. Mm -hmm. Because the things that you implement for homework six, you can also use for your project. Any questions and clarifications? Okay, if there are not, if there are no further questions, oh, there's one. We mentioned previously that you will be implementing four algorithms, five, five, five in this course. In this course, maybe, okay, carry on. Um, and can only make six submissions. But you also have ensembles. Okay, so we, that counts as one. We can have on, you can have an ensemble of different things and each of them counts as one. So you can mix and match ensembles and features and patches. Okay, so today we're going to start a new topic. Uh, we're going to look at support vector machines. And this, uh, since I like to kind of place things on a timeline of when things were invented, uh, the kind of content that we are in, we will encounter today and hopefully wrap up on Thursday um, is stuff from mid nineties to mid to late 2000s. Um, so we are getting into the 21st century here. Uh, the big picture is we've looked at linear models. Um, in particular, we've also looked at algorithms for linear models. And at the same time, we've been having this discussion on how do I know if a learning algorithm uh, is good? How do I know if a certain concept is learnable? There are different ways of answering this question. If you answer this question using the framework of online learning, we end up with algorithms for linear classifiers. Uh, we've seen one of them called Perceptron. There's another one if you're interested. Uh, it's called Wino, um, or a generalization of that has something called uh, uh, the exponentiated gradient algorithm. But we've not covered that in the class, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, we answered this question of how good is a learning algorithm using this framework of SPAC. And we talked about PAC and agnostic learning and infinite uh, hypothesis spaces and we see dimensions and such things. Once again, we can apply this lens towards learning linear models. And this naturally leads to uh, the, the idea of support vector machine. And that's what we're going to look at today. Turns out this is not the end of this thing. We, we can answer this question in other ways. Uh, in particular, we look at one more, thing, one more perspective in this semester. Uh, uh, which is uh, from the Bayesian perspective. And uh, if you answer this question using the Bayesian way and you apply that lens to look at linear models, it turns out we will invent logistic regression. So different ways of looking at this question of what it means to learn naturally gives rise to different families of learning algorithms. Given this, let's look at support vector machines today. Um, this lecture will uh, start off with this idea that a good way to define uh, a good objective to optimize for learning is to maximize the market. And we'll work this out in steps to write down what I'm calling the support vector machine objective. It's usually also called uh, the max margin uh, objective or the, max, the margin loss. Once you frame it as an optimization problem, we can use whatever optimization algorithm that exists out there to solve it. We'll look at one that's really popular, one that you've already seen actually, stochastic gradient descent. And that's pretty much all I'll cover in this unit. Um, there is an additional lecture on, uh, on support vectors and duals and kernels that I'm not going to cover. If you're interested, the material is available on the, on the class website. Let's start off with uh, uh, this idea that we can train by maximizing a margin. And to kind of uh, kickstart this discussion, I want to go back to some, something that we've seen before on VC dimension. Uh, we know that uh, we've seen this, uh, that uh, the generalization error of a hypothesis is bounded on top by it's the training error of that hypothesis plus some big expression involving a VC dimension. And the, the, the statement is formally, uh, you can say this as, 
If you have m examples, then the, with high probability, probability one minus delta, the true error of the, uh, any hypothesis h is upper bounded by the training error plus that expression uh, inside that uh, inside the red uh, oval. So if you you don't have to look, you don't have to stare at this too much. But uh, one thing that immediately is worth thinking about is this is true for any hypothesis. We want, but what do we really want? Our goal is to find a hypothesis that has low generalization error. We have no idea about that expression because we don't know what this capital D is. And this is really an expectation. We can't compute that expectation. But despite not knowing the distribution, we know something else. We know that the training error is the generalization error plus uh, is less than, sorry, the generalization error is less than the training error plus some function of VT dimension. And if you if you stare at this function a little bit, you'll see that lowering the VT dimension will reduce this whole thing here, which means the lowering the VC dimension gives us a, a tighter upper bound. So a natural strategy here is I can't really train, I can't really optimize directly for generalization error. Instead, let me try to optimize for that quantity there. Let me try to make the, the right hand side as small as possible. And by doing that, my generalization error will also become small. Right, because it, it generalization error has to be less than that, and that's the that's going to be the training object. So there are two terms here: there's the training error and the VC dimension. This is one piece of information that we uh, we've already seen so far. Another piece of information that we've already seen is the VC dimension of a linear classifier. For any linear classifier, its VC dimension is d plus one. If you have d-dimensional fe uh, uh, features. So this quantity here, I say that picking a lower VC dimension gives us a tighter bound, but if the VC dimension is just D plus one, that means the only way to reduce the VC dimension is to reduce D, the dimensionality, the number of features. So if you pick, if you can find a linear classifier with fewer features, then the generalization error is going to be low. But that seems, that seems weird. We can't really control the number of features. Maybe the, the, the problem naturally needs D features. So given a D-dimensional um, uh, instance space, we can't really control this. So how, how could we possibly find a hypothesis that minimizes the VC dimension? Alternatively, another way to think about this question is this quantity inside the shaded box if I if I show you that quantity here, it does not depend on little h. The choice of the hypothesis does not really influence the thing that is shaded. So how can your learning algorithm influence that quantity by choosing a hypothesis? Does this question make sense? I see a no. Um, maybe you can ask me a question. We may have to control m or delta. We can't control m. M is the training size, and delta is something that is sitting outside the whole thing. Uh, so capital H is the total set of the uh, uh, so concept class. Yes. So if you choose the concept class, can you choose both small h and capital H? If we choose the concept class, we implicitly are restricting the choice of little h. But we're not picking little h. Remember, the learning algorithm does not get to control capital H. The learning algorithm is given capital H, and then it says, inside this hypothesis space, I'm finding little h. The learning algorithm only gets to choose little h. Right? Yes. to lower this amount without getting rid of features, couldn't we do something like PCA and then work in less? Yeah, we could. That's the, uh, yes, that's one way of thinking about it. But implicitly, so rather than me, it's the learning algorithm that does something like PCA to reduce the dimensionality, thereby lowering the VC damage. 
this is a weird situation. It seems like we don't have too much control here. So let me now uh, change the question because if you don't like the question, let's change the question. Um, I said the Ricci dimension of linear classifier is d plus one, and you took it on, on faith. Um, but that that seems weird. Does this mean that all linear classifiers are the same in according to the Ricci dimension? Let's uh, let's look at an example uh, to kind of highlight that point. Um, we need to think about something that we've already seen before, namely the concept of a margin. The margin of a hyperplane is simply the distance from the hyperplane to its nearest data point. So this distance here is the margin of this hyperplane. So with the margin of hyperplane for this data set is simply that distance. Now, consider now the following two hyperplanes. There is H1 and H2. Which line is a better choice for classifying this data set? H2. There are people saying H2. I want to kind of note that I would like to point out that both of these classifiers have a perfect accuracy on this data set. So there is nothing with respect to the training accuracy that allows us to pick one over the other. Why would H2 be better? Because it provides a better separation of two classes. It provides a better separation of the two classes. What do you mean? The two classes are separated, even if the hyperplane was not there, the two classes have this separation. So what is the hyperplane doing there? You're kind of getting in the right direction though. The margin is larger for H2. So? Uh, oh, I mean, if, if the margin is larger, it's like farther from like the nearest point. So it's like, it, it's like it has a more even classification. Why is more even better? Yes. I think we might Interesting. Why? Can you think of a situation oh. where uh, H1 would do poorly? Or in fact, rather than thinking of H1 having this margin here, consider an extreme case where H1 actually is somewhere here. Very, very close to the point. Yes. Um, you have like two sets of data points and they roughly like cluster around each other with like some amount of noise. So uh, a line with a much larger margin is going to be more like is going to classify points with more noise more accurately because if the line right up against all the positive points and there's like, some amount of noise, much more likely to end up on the other side of the line. That's basically the argument I'm looking for. I see a lot more hands, so maybe I'll ask, I saw you and then you, so. Kind of just what was said there, when the line gets a little too close to one grouping, it biases the other one in the, the other grouping in the uh, classification. So if you put it as close to the center between the two mm -hmm. places possible, helps prevent the bias and push one to the other. That's Roughly also the same argument, yes, but that's good. Are we still assuming that our training example that John is saying this should be? Yes, by, yes. So if it's going to say this distribution, we could expect future examples to be close to those centers, mm -hmm. but not necessarily on. The more data we have, the more likely we will be that thing that we class separately in the future. Yeah. So th th that's right. I mean, think of a future data point. Let's say it sits somewhere here. And it, it, H1 is going to classify it as minus. H2 is going to classify it as a plus because it's roughly here. But we don't know what the true label is. Uh, but if H2 is in between those two, there is a little bit more room for points from plus to be farther away from their center. We're, we are assuming that data comes from this distribution, but not the, your data points are not guaranteed to only lie on that side far, far away. They might lie closer to the, to the line. And data points that are closer to the line, there's a little bit of 
margin of safety in some sense that is a buffer zone uh, where uh, you don't get uh, these negative points or sorry the, the positive point may lie closer to the line and yet be positive um, in some uh, so h2 the, the the there's another comment here h2 provides uh, lower risk of generalization error in the future because future points are only coming from the distribution but not necessarily from the exact set so they might lie closer to the separating hyperplane um, this new example uh, that's not from the training set might be misclassified if the margin is smaller so this is a, an intuitive argument the intuition here is larger margins are better rather than thinking of any single hyperplanes consider Entire sets of hyperplanes. Let's say H1, capital H1, is a set of linear classifiers, all of which have a margin gamma 1. H2 is a set of linear classifiers, all of which have a margin gamma 2. You can think of many lines that have the same margin. And let's say gamma 1 is, mar uh, is larger than gamma 2, then intuitively, or rather the claim is that the entire set of functions H1, which have a larger margin, are better than the set of functions H2, which have a smaller margin, for the same sort of intuitive argument that we had before. And this is uh, the, the, the this this argument is independent of whether H1 and H2 are all separating the data. In fact, we can safely assume here that every function in both H1 and H2 perfectly classify the data, like little H1 and H2 that we saw before. They all have the they all have zero training error. It's just that H1 has a larger margin, and the claim is that the entire set of functions H1 is better. Both H1 and H2 are linear classifiers in the same uh, uh, instance space, so they all have the same dimensionality and such things. This claim is actually a theorem by Vapnik. Uh, uh, Vapnik is the same uh, person whose name goes into the whose V in VC. So suppose you have a set of linear classifiers H. That has uh, that that all separate the training data with a certain margin gamma. Then the VC dimension is not d plus one. It's actually the lower of if I this is d plus one and this is r square over gamma square plus one. So it's the lower of d plus one and r square over gamma square plus one. And where R is the same R that we saw, capital R is the same capital R that we saw in the perceptron bar. It's the radius of the smallest circle or the smallest sphere that contains the entire training data. Gamma is the same thing that we saw for perceptron. It's the margin of uh, this set of functions. So the, what Vapnik says is, if you have a set of functions that have a margin gamma, and you have another set of functions that has Let's say, let's say the first set has gamma 1 and gamma 2, the second one has gamma 2, and the VC dimension of the first set, which is r square over gamma square plus 1, is lower than the VC dimension of the second set. So this is a data-dependent definition of the VC dimension. To put this more uh, simply, if the as the margin gets larger, the VC dimension gets lower, and of course, we know that the lower VC dimension means there's a better generalization bar. This gives us a recipe for training uh, the classifiers. But before we talk about that, are there any questions about uh, this thing? Yes. Oh, so please, uh, I mean, it does not I mean the larger margin is the lower VC because, uh, for example, we, uh, Margin one is larger than margin two, but uh, in both cases, the D is the. Of course, of course. I mean, uh, the, the, there is a. Uh, yes, there is a little D that also shows up, but given that the dimensionality is fixed, if you can keep making the margin smaller and larger and larger and larger, eventually you'll get to a point where the VC dimension gets smaller. Why? Because, because of the theorem. E is already the minimum, right? <laughs> Who says the D is minimum? Because it's possible that R square over gamma square is less than D. But the E, if gamma one is gamma two, both are 
they make the first uh, vector larger than d that that should be the same right? yeah sure then make uh, then use gamma is not gamma 1 or gamma 2 but gamma 3 which is so big that uh, oh, it becomes less. Okay. eventually you will get to a gamma that is yeah. large that that, that makes r square over gamma square less than d mm -hmm. yes so it's confirmed. the point of all this is that we're trying to get to dc dimension without altering d correct without altering d that's right okay. We are trying to, well, we don't care about altering D, but we are trying to reduce the DC dimension um, by controlling the thing that the learning algorithm can control, namely the weight of the linear classifier. And it turns out that uh, uh, the linear classifier, the, the weights of the linear classifier directly controls gamma. The May I ask one question? Yes. Would it be possible if we were to train some sort of linear classifier on a given set of data? And we know the general range in which the data lies. Mm -hmm. If in the future we ask the machine to make a prediction on a future data point, but the machine re recognizes that the data point it receives is close to the margin, i.e. significantly close to the margin mm -hmm. than the data it was provided, if it can reasonably assume that that data is something outside the range it was meant to train for, could it report that to the user? You, of course you can. And uh, you can do that, or you can uh, use the distance from the hyperplane and you can normalize it in a certain way. Uh, uh, just to kind of foreshadow this, you can normalize it using the logistic uh, function and uh, make it a probability uh, or a confidence in the model that the model has. So you, the distance from the hyperplane can be seen as a measure of confidence. Yes. Uh, I think okay. All right. So this gives us uh, a new strategy for learning. The goal of learning is not just to maximize the training data fit, but also, sorry, uh, yeah, maximize the training data fit or minimize the training error, but also to maximize the margin. Find a, among all linear separators that are equally good, pick the one that maximizes the margin because that can generalize better. Why can that generalize better? Because larger margins lead to lower DP dimension, lower DP dimension leads to better generalization. So this is going to lead us to the SVM objective. Before we start on the SVM objective, any questions about this discussion on margin? Yes. You, you don't prove the theory. I'm not proving the thing. I can point you to a book that has the proof. Bhasmik's book actually has the proof. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's look at the SVM objective. So far, what we've seen is the same objective tends to, we're going to build it up in stages because uh, this tends to be a little bit involved. So let's, uh, I'm going to keep coming back to this sort of uh, uh, big picture view. So far, what we've seen is we know from learning theory that low, lower VT dimension leads to better generalization. And uh, we know thanks to Vapnik that for linear separators, the VC dimension is inversely dependent on the square of the margin, which means larger margin leads to better generalization because it has lower VC dimension. Let's now think about the margin a little bit more detail because we're going to try to make the loss. We're going to try to define a learning objective for maximizing the margin. So we need to stare at this margin a bit. So I'm going to work through this cartoon example in two dimensions here. This is a, a line with, the, there are two features, x1 and x2, and the, the linear classifier is defined by a line, which is uh, b plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 equals zero. If it is greater than zero, then this classifier says it's positive. If it's less than zero, then it says it's negative. Now, the prediction of the linear classifier does not really care about the value so for any example here, let's say we have x1, x2. For this example, for the prediction does not really care about the actual value of b plus w1, x1 plus w2, x2. It only computes that quantity and just takes the sign of it and says it's positive or negative. We've seen this before and you've implemented this for your homeworks. The other thing that's also worth uh, recalling from I don't know when you encounter uh, distances of lines from planes and such things, but the distance of this line, sorry, distances of lines from points, the distance of this line 
from any point x1, x2 is simply the absolute value of w1, x1 plus w2, x2 plus b divided by the square root of w1 square plus w2 square. Uh, this is true. The reason we have an absolute value there is because we know that on this side, w1, x1 plus w2, x2 plus b is positive, whereas on this side, it's negative and distances have to be positive. So if it's a negative thing, we need to multiply by minus 1 so that we get the absolute value. If it's a negative thing, we, we are going to multiply by minus 1, why not just multiply by the label? Because the label, y, for those examples, is minus. So instead of saying the absolute value of w1x1 plus w2x2 plus b, I can just say y times w1x1 plus w2x2 plus b. That's the numerator. In the denominator, this is simply w1 square plus w2 square, the square root of that. That's simply the length of that vector w. So I can rewrite this whole thing as in if you want to generalize this out of two dimensions, I can rewrite that as y times w transpose x plus b divided by the norm of w. This is this the thing I've written at the bottom does not really care about the number of features you have, it's just in general always true. Hopefully you've seen this before. Yes. So just to clarify, this is between any hyperplane and a point. Yes, that's right. The distance in general, the distance between a hyperplane and a point is the absolute value of W transpose X, the W transpose X plus B divided by the norm of B. In this case, because each X is associated with a Y, which takes care of that absolute value, we don't need the absolute value. Okay. There's another uh I'm, I'm just listing out a bunch of properties that we're going to use to, to get to the eventual SPM objective. Another property that I mentioned briefly before, but I want to get into a little bit in detail, is the fact that we don't really care about the value of W transpose X plus B for a new example. All we need is the sign. We just need to know whether it's greater than zero or less than zero. We don't care whether it is 10,000 or 500,000 because they're both greater than zero and it gets thresholded to plus one. Because we don't care about the actual value of it, we can multiply and divide the W's and the B's by any positive number. So if the equation of the lines is B plus W1 X1 plus W2 X2 equals zero, the equation of the line is also half b plus half w1 x1 plus half w2 x2 equals zero. The equation of the line is also 1000 b plus 1000 w1 x1 plus 1000 w2 x2 equals zero. These are all the same line. And in fact, we don't really care about the fact that we are multiplying or dividing by a positive number because eventually we only care about the sign. The sign of b plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 is the same as the sign of 1000 b plus 1000 W1 X1 plus 1000 W2 X2. So we can multiply and divide by any positive number and that gives us a degree of freedom. We can choose that number carefully so that the next step becomes easier. And I've not yet told you what the next step is, but I'm just kind of setting things up here. Any questions about this? This is all background. There's a question. Could I explain why? Uh, ah, okay. So the question is, could you explain why the lower VC dimension is better? Because based on the VC definition, which is the size of the largest finite subset, uh, it seems like larger VC dimension is better. The reason is, um, the reason is that uh, when we when we derived, we didn't derive it, I just stated it. When I stated the generalization bound, it looks like this. The generalization, the, the error, the generalization error of a hypothesis is strictly bounded by, well, not strictly, it's bounded by the training error of the same hypothesis plus a term involving we see dimension of the hypothesis space. And 
the reason, so now let's consider our goal is to make this quantity as small as possible. We want to make, I started to draw a nice box. Our goal is to make this quantity as small as possible, but we don't know how to measure that thing. Instead, what we'll do is find a hypothesis H such that this whole expression, let's call this the right-hand side, which is a function of the hypothesis, such that, that the right-hand side of H is reduced as much as possible. If the right-hand side is reduced as much as possible, then naturally, because mathematics tells us that the generalization error is less than the right-hand side, the generalization error also goes down. Now, let's consider these two terms separately on the right-hand side. The first term is the training error. This quantity is simply asking uh, how well does the hypothesis H fit uh, the, the training data that we have. The lowest we can get in the training error is zero. We can, because zero just means that every example in the training data is perfectly classified. The second term asks how complex is the hypothesis space? And if you, uh, 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 from the previous, uh, I think from the lecture from two weeks ago, the general idea, we have an Occam's razor. Choosing a hypothesis space capital H with who, that, whose complexity is lower leads to better generalization. Here's another version of the same result. If because this expression inside the box increases as the VC dimension increases, the, if, I'm, if my goal is to reduce this whole thing, my, then my goal might equivalently be equal to uh, uh, finding hy a hypothesis space with lower VC dimension. So it doesn't directly come out of the definition of the VC dimension. It comes out of the properties of this function. Is that, uh, does that uh, clarify things? Yes. By that, I mean the fact that we have the diagnostic learning theorem. The VC dimension plays a part in the sample complexity bar. Yes. Our HS, right-hand side. Yes. Yes, sorry. My handwriting is not the most illuminating. Uh-oh. Sorry, one second. I can't find my slides. Yes. Yes. Uh, slide 20. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Because we have the VC dimension of uh, H1 is the min of R square over gamma 1 square. Right? Um, gamma 1 is more than gamma 2. That means, because this is true for H1 and H2, so I'm not going to write both of them here. So it's just, I can say of H is this. If gamma one is more than gamma two, then this quantity, I should not use my hand, then this quantity here will be, sorry, if gamma one is more than gamma two, then this quantity here will be lower for gamma one because it's inversely proportional. And if it goes below D, let's assume that R square over gamma square, gamma one square and gamma two square are less than D, then this quantity for H one will be lower. And we know that lower VC dimensions generalize better, have lower sample complexity. Yes. Larger margin, because if margin, larger margin is larger gamma. No, no, no. This is the bigger one. H2 has a bigger margin. So this is, in this case, this has gamma 1, this is gamma 2, gamma 1 greater than gamma 2, and we prefer 
uh, actually my one and two are messed up here, but we prefer the larger marks. Okay, so now I think we should move on to the SVM objective. What we had before was uh, some background on the geometry of the linear classifier. Let's go back to this idea that we want to maximize the margin. Let's formally define the margin. I said the margin of a hyperplane is simply the distance of the closest data points from the hyperplane. We know that the distance of any point x let's say that uh, point x whose label is y from a hyperplane w comma b is simply y w transpose x plus b divided by the norm of w. That's what uh, I wrote in the previous uh, slide. Now, my goal is to find, let's now consider the, uh, we have not one point x, y, but many, many data points indexed by i. So we don't care about all the data points. We care about the one that's closest to the hyperplane. Remember, even in this picture, when I was computing the margin, I didn't really say, uh, I didn't talk about the margin being defined. I, I really didn't care about these points here. The only thing that mattered to me was this thing, the closest one. So what we can do is we can enumerate all the data points that we have and find the one that has the that's closest. What does it mean to find the one that's closest? It has it's the one that has the lowest distance from the hyperplane. That's why we have min over i. So the margin of a hyperplane with respect to the data set is simply the minimum distance of any point from the hyperplane. Okay. I've just uh, written in math what I've been saying uh, informally so far. Our goal. This is the margin of this particular hyperplane defined by W and B. Our training goal is to find the data set, find the hyperplane that has the maximum margin. So the training goal is to find among all values of W and B. W and B are now real numbers. W is a vector, B is a number. Among all the possible values of W and B, we want to find that weight vector and bias that has the maximum value of the margin. Uh, sometimes this, uh, in the literature, sometimes this uh, quantity is called the geometric margin. Uh, the numerator alone is sometimes called the functional margin. This is just terminology. We're not going to worry about it too much. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just a quick notational thing. Uh, the top one is yeah. saying we are finding the minimum right value. Yes. The one on the bottom says we're finding the parameters that maximize the in the at the top, we are defining the margin of, of a hyperplane by choosing the point by finding the point that's closest to the hyperplane. What does it mean for the point to be closest? It has a minimum distance. So among all the examples that exist, find the data point that minimizes this distance. So my question was how do we delineate between when that notation is saying find the minimum value versus find the parameters that keep Oh, sure. Uh, in that case, that's min. In this case, I see, I see. So the goal of learning is really argmax. Uh, no. It's argmax, but in in the process of computing that argmax, we just solve the maximization problem. We get the argmax out of it. Yes. What's the difference between max and argmax? Max is the maximum value. Arg max is the actual is the input that gives you that maximum value. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yes. Excellent question. Very good question. There is a footnote here that uh, that probably will show up maybe the next slide even. We want to maximize this margin among all data points, uh, sorry, among all hyperplanes that perfectly separate the data. It's not a footnote that's going to show up, but it will feature heavily in our discussion going ahead. Let's go back to this. Uh, I, I want to remind you that we don't care about the actual value of W and B. We only care about the sign of B plus W transpose X. Which means there must be many, many different 
W's and B's that essentially give you the same margin. The many numerical values of W and B that give you the same margin because we only care about the fact. There, there's that extra degree of freedom. So let's try to get rid of that. What we can do now is what, what I mean by I can multiply or divide the weight by any number and the prediction won't change is I can scale the weight and the biases by some positive constant such that the that I can choose I can choose whatever constant I can say that I can scale the weights by the number four divide everything by four or just uh, so that we don't have to commit to any number I'm going to scale the weights by some number c c is yet to be decided okay we have to choose what is a good value of c one way to think about it is the problematic part here is this numerator. It's this, this is just an ugly optimization problem. Mm. So let's try to choose a certain value of C so that the numerator goes away. Let's choose a value of C so that the numerator takes the value one. I can choose C so that the for the point that defines the margin, this distance is simply one, the, the functional margin, the numerator becomes one. I don't choose the C that way. I can implicitly, in hindsight, have picked the C that makes that happen. So if I do that, the margin is simply the distance of the closest point. That's the only point that matters. So the margin simply becomes one over um, W1 divided by C square plus W2 divided by C square, the square root of that. Now, this is a bit of a subtle argument. So, uh, try to replay it in your head and we, ask me questions. We have not yet defined a learning algorithm. I'm just doing this, cho choosing the C in hindsight. Yes. It seems very unintuitive to me that B disappears from that. Yeah, the B is a bit of a weirdness. It turns out it doesn't really matter. Um, just trust me that it doesn't. It's not going to matter right now. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, I had a student in this class. When he saw this, he was very upset that I did this, pulled this trick. So he went and proved it to himself and to me that it doesn't matter. Um, you can try that. Uh, just trust me that it's it's okay. I guess B is implicitly in C. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we see a vector and that's why it's a number. number. It's a number. That's why I'm able to divide uh, each W by C. My choice of C is going to be uh, instead of thinking of choosing C up front, think of it as I'm going to consider, I'm going to uh, find every possible W, W1, W2, and B that separates this data. I'm going to do that. Let's say that the, the, the W1, W2, and B that separates the data is actually these things. And then I will scale the Ws so that the point that defines the margin, namely this circled blue point, has, um, uh, has the value of this numerator equals 1. The closest point is at a, has, a, has a normalized distance of 1. I can do that in hindsight. And that only changes the values of W. Right? But that makes things a lot easier going ahead. So rather than you know, rather than calling it W1 divided by C and W2 divided by C, let me just call it a U1 and a U2. And now my goal of the goal of my learning algorithm is not to learn the Ws, but I just need to find the U's. I don't care about the W's and the B, uh, I do care about the B, uh, but I don't care about the W and the C separately because I just care about the ratio W divided by C and B divided by C. So I'm gonna call this one over U1 square plus U2 square. In fact, let me not call it one over U1 square plus U2 square. Let me just call it one over W1 square plus square root of W1 square plus W2 square. The goal of learning is to find those Ws. But those Ws are not really 
you can't choose them freely. They need to be defined, set up so that for the closest point here, this quantity equals one. Questions, ask me questions now. Yes. Uh, no, actually, I like I, I like your argument better. It was completely an accident that they are a different font, but that's really what they, the, the 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 goal is. They should have been this. They should really have been W over C. But we don't care about W over C because we only care of eventually. We're not going to use W and C to make the prediction because we just want to take the dot product and take the sign. So we're just going to use this. So your argument is a much much more a much kinder interpretation of my mistake. The reason we can kind of ignore C is because earlier when you showed us that multiplying by some scalar value, the B plus WI yeah. plus that, all of that doesn't ultimately matter as far as the separation. That's right. right? The only thing that matters is the whether it's positive or negative, that quantity. And multiplying by a positive number is not going to change that. That's why I said we have that degree of freedom that we can control um, to make this optimization problem that I'll define easier. Yeah. If somebody were to give us the, this, this new W1, W2, another uh -huh. divided by C, we wouldn't implicitly know the location of that line. You do. Uh, you, it turns out you also need to find, the, you'll know the B also. We'll know the B. We will know the, the Ws. No, not from the W. You'll separately be finding the B as well. Because oh. the, the Ws can, are not, you're not no longer free to choose the W and B. They have to be defined so that this quantity equals one for this point here. W1, X1 plus W2, X2 plus V should be equal to one for the point that's closest. And it should be strictly more than one for all the other points, well, greater than or equal to one for every point. Right? So that still uh, factors in. So we are trying to learn those. Mm, uh, where can biases by learning these ways? So uh, it turns out these Ws and these Ws are the same thing. And that's the point about the font. Um, it's going to be the same thing because for the hyperplane, if W1, X1 plus W2, X2 plus B equals zero, then the whole thing divided by C will also be equal to zero. So we'll just learn W1 divided by B, W2 divided by B, and sorry, W1 divided by C, W2 divided by C, and B divided by C. We're not going to actually call it that. We'll just call it W1, W2, and B. Good questions. Uh, think about this a little bit more, but if you don't really care about the discussion, the whole point here is maximizing, just to kind of recap where we were, the margin of the hyperplane is the distance of the closest point. So for any hyperplane defined by W and B, I can enumerate all the points that I have and find the distance of the closest point, and that's the, the margin of uh, that particular Hyperplane. The goal of learning, following the reasoning in the three dimensions and such things, is to find that hyperplane, that choice of W and B, that maximizes this margin. So among all choices of W and B, find the one that maximizes gamma W B. But it turns out that there's a lot of redundancy in this optimization problem because we can divide, we can scale W and B by any constant. And if we carefully choose the constant, then we uh, uh, then we, we simplify the optimization problem. Maximizing over all the weights, and I'm dropping the B here, the B is going to show up. Um, assume the B is always there because it's the it's now folded into the feature space. Maximizing the margin is equivalent to maximizing over all the weights, one over the norm of W, provided the closest point has a score or the, uh, the functional margin, namely this quantity here, equal to one. If the if y times w transpose x plus b equals one for the closest point, then then simply finding the weight vector that maximizes one over norm of w gives you the max margin classifier. Yes. We have to we have to set that closest point equal to one for for both the positives and the negatives. 
Yes, uh, sure. But the Y times that takes care of it. Oh, okay. And in fact, if your hyperplane is in the middle, then they will be equal for both the positive and the negative. This is a lot of words. So let's make this a little bit, uh, let's start putting this in symbols. Um, maximizing the uh, one over the norm of W is exact. So maximizing over W, one over the norm of W. This problem is equivalent to the, the, the W that maximizes this quantity is exactly the same as the W that minimizes the norm of W. Right? Yeah. The one that minimizes the norm of W is exactly the same as the one that minimizes the squared norm of W. Because norm is a positive number, squaring it is not going to change the minimum. But the squared norm of W is exactly the same as W transpose W the dot product of the vector with itself. Questions? There is a question on Zoom that the margin is defined to be the closest negative. Does it matter whether we use x1 and x2 of the positive or the negative in setting C? It does not. In fact, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be the same value. And this is because the margin is uh, the max margin classifier will be in between the closest positive and negatives. It will bisect that region there. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, but in the previous definition for the magnitude of W, the guy. Yeah, that's that's where I'm being a little bit sloppy with my notation. It turns out that that change does not matter. Yeah. So let's. Write this a little bit more formally. Um, and this gives us something called max margin classifiers. Our learning problem is to minimize over. It's just, uh, how many people have encountered, have not seen optimization problems written this way? Okay, so I'll walk you through this step by step. So we want to, this is a formal specification of a problem. I want to minimize this quantity over this search space. Uh, uh, sorry, minimize the thing in the box by varying the thing inside the circle. I'm going to minimize half W not transpose W, the value of half W transpose W, by searching over all possible values of W. And when I say searching over all possible values of W, that I, I mean every possible vector that can exist. This is a sort of a very, uh, there is a naive and brute force way of doing this, which is enumerating every possible vector vector and finding the value of W transpose W and taking the minimum. Of course, that's not going to work because we are talking real numbers. Uh, so we need a program. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why do we need the one half? Why do we need the one half? For the same reason we had a one half in, uh, in least mean squares. Because I'm going to take the gradient. This is the square. So we'll kind of we'll not have to carry around the two. So the goal of learning is to minimize this quantity, half W transpose W. Why did we get half W transpose W? Because our goal originally was to maximize one over norm W, but this is the same as minimizing the norm of W, which is the same as minimizing. Maximizing this quantity is the same as minimizing this quantity, which is the same as minimizing W transpose W. I can multiply by any positive number and I'm going to multiply by. And, but we're not free to choose our W because remember, we want only those W's that, that set the closest point to the hyperplane to have W transpose uh, X, the absolute value of W transpose X to be equal to one. If it's true for the closest point that X equal to one, for every point, it must be at least one. If the minimum value of y w transpose x equals one, then for every point, it's greater than or equal to one. So this is a constrained optimization problem. I want to find w that minimizes this quantity such that for every i, this constraint holds. Minimizing this quantity gives us the maximum of one over norm w, which is basically maximizing the margin. And this condition 
is true for every example, and in particular, the one that's closest. This closest point is that circle plus that I showed in the previous slide. This is an optimization problem. I'm not going to tell you how to solve this optimization problem yet. Um, because it turns out this form of an optimization problem is especially convenient. This form of, of an optimization, let's kind of let's examine this a little bit. The thing that you're minimizing is a quadratic quantity. W transpose W is just this thing here is nothing but sum over WI square for each weight, weight in the weight vector. Yeah. So this thing is quadratic and the constraints are all linear inequalities. This kind of an optimization problem is called a quadratic program. And here the word program is used uh, in a sense that is different from computer programming. Uh, I'm not going to tell you, uh, if you're interested, you can look it up on your own. So this kind of an optimization problem is called a quadratic programming problem. And uh, it's very well studied in the optimization literature. It has been, there's like a ton of uh, algorithms for solving QPs, quadratic programs. So what we are really doing is, I need to solve this optimization problem. I need to solve this learning problem. Rather than me solving a learning problem, let me convert it into an optimization problem and make it someone else's problem. Because it's the job of the optimization community. Yes. Uh, in this particular, this exact formalism does not work for more than two classes, but there's a very, very natural extension for multi-class SVM. Um, I personally find that to be very, very elegant. Unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about it right now, but uh, it's it's a very, very clean extension. In fact, uh, um, that idea, I believe, even got a test of time pay award from uh, ICML 2010 or something, because it's, it, it was an influential uh, way to think about it. Okay, this optimization problem is called the hard SVM, hard support vector machine. And by hard, I don't mean difficult, but uh, it has a hard threshold here. We'll look at how to solve this optimization problem later. So, can someone tell me what's the problem with this? How to solve the problem? Why have to assume that is not set in the This says that that's really the thing. Look at this constraint a little bit more carefully. It says, for every data point indexed by i, I need y w transpose x to be greater than or equal to 1. 1 is more than 0. That means for every data point, you need y w transpose x to be positive. If y w transpose x is positive, we know from our discussion with linear classifiers, we saw this in Bozeptron. If it's positive, that means that example is correctly classified. That means for every data point, this weight vector correctly classifies it. This assumes that the data is linearly separable. What happens if your data is not linearly separable? And that goes to the comment that you had earlier. What happens if your data is not linearly separable? If your data is not linearly separable, this constraint here, right? This is actually a set of constraints. It's true for all i. This set of constraints defines, in general, this set of constraints defines a set of weight vectors that are allowed for that optimization. If the data is not linearly separable, this set of constraints defines an empty set. Basically, what it says is among all the weight vectors that are inside this empty set, find the one that has the highest W transpose W. How many weight vectors are in an empty set? None. How many vectors can we possibly find? None. In other words, if this data set is not linearly separable, this optimization problem using terminology from programming causes an exception. This is an ill-defined problem if your data is not linearly separable. Mm -hmm. Another way of thinking about it is this is a way to test whether your, da your data set is linearly separable. Mm -hmm. You run this optimizer, if it throws an exception, it's not linearly separable. Mm -hmm. But let's uh, just quickly recap where we are. Lower VC dimensions leads to better generalization. Larger margin leads to lower VC dimension. And for the separable case, the agenda here is among all linear classifiers that separate the data, find the one that maximizes the margin. Or equivalently, 
among all classifiers, W, such that the Y W transpose of X is more than one, find the one that has the lowest norm of the weight vector, lowest W transpose W. So if the data is not linearly separable, we are in trouble. The hard SVM fails if your data is not linearly separable because this is a constraint optimization problem. And uh, this kind of an optimization problem where the constraints define an empty set, it's called an infeasible optimization problem. So what can we do here? Any ideas? We can allow some uh, some constraints to be uh, violated. Some constraints. Constraint. Which ones? So the, the suggestion is maybe we can allow some of the constraints to be violated. Why should that work? Why, why, why might that work? What does it mean for a constraint to be violated? The data is not strictly linearly separated. Mm -hmm. And go on. Every constraint corresponds to one example. That's the intuition. But uh, let's. The problem is you can have another optimization parameter where we minimize the number of misclassified points. We could. That's right. We could do that by saying that. But why? Why, why would that help? Because then we'll always have some um, weights that will. The, the criteria, but we have some way to also extend the quality. So another way, so another way of thinking about it is, if you if the, the, the suggestion is you have something else, another term in this optimization that says I want to minimize the number of misclassified points because it's not a question of whether we are getting whether we are going to get a, a perfect classifier or not. We are just trying to make good of a bad situation. All weight vectors are going to make mistakes. Let's find the weight vectors that make the fewest number of mistakes. Did you have? Yeah, I, I understand. Okay, these are all good suggestions. And in fact, the full F version of the SVM captures all of them. The key idea here is what you said before. Allow some example to break into the margin, so to speak. So let's look at this example here. I've just taken the same data set and added two more data points. There is a plus here and a minus here. Clearly, this data is not linearly separable. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine that there's an oracle that comes to you and says, these two highlighted points are actually problem, uh, problematic points. These two highlighted points are noise. Now go find a good classifier. What you might do is say, if those two points are noise, let me just toss them out and try to uh, and find a classifier that separates the rest of the data. I can do that. So if we had an oracle that says these points are bad, we would be able to uh, solve the optimization problem. The hard SVM will still work. So, yeah, and you might find a hyperplane that looks like this, where those two circle points are clearly problematic. They're problematic in two ways. This point here is just on the wrong side of the margin. If everything here is a plus, the minus that is circled is in the region that plus. This point here is not necessarily bad because if you did not, if you had that point, let's go back to the previous picture. Let's say that the highlighted point is the only one that erased. You can still draw a hyperplane that separates the data with this, this margin. And it says this side is plus. But if you remove this plus that's in the middle, then you can get a much bigger margin. So now the trade-off is, do you keep that point, get a small margin, and maybe generalize worse? Or do you toss that point, get a larger margin, and maybe generalize much better? There's a choice that we need to make. Questions? Yes. So a generalization error is going to be less than our training error plus. Yeah, we see the term involving we see dimension. They are 
possibly have training data to minimize the least intervention or not making our training error. The other term is now getting bigger. Yeah. And so now we need to find a sweet spot. Mm -hmm. The two extreme cases would be toss out all the data points and find a weight vector that separates whatever is left, which is nothing, or keep as many of them as necessary and maybe end up overfitting. Uh oh. Maybe end up overfitting like this. And this because this means that we need our optimizer to make a choice for us. So rather than us deciding who where, what points should be um, kept or not, we're going to make it part of the optimization. When computing the margin, we're going to try to compute the margin so that only those points that are quote unquote not ignored factor into the calculation. Okay, I'll stop here because the, the, the up from this, I'm going to build up to the general SVM and that will take us to an optimization objective that we can then use stochastic gradient descent to solve. Uh, we'll look at that on Thursday. Uh, if you have any questions, you can take them now or you can come to office hours.